Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the joint lecture on Pakistan's capital market development by guest speaker, Dr. Shamshad Akhtar, former Under Secretary General, United Nations, and former Governor of the State Bank of Pakistan. This lecture is jointly organized by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore and the High Commission of, Islam, of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan in Singapore. Before we proceed with the event proper, we would appreciate it if, you're, if you could mute your microphones and switch off your videos throughout the session. If you have any questions or feedback to share, you may forward them via the Zoom chat. We shall consolidate them for the guest speaker to answer during the question and answer session. We would like to inform you that today's joint lecture is being live streamed on the ISAR's Facebook page. We are pleased to acknowledge the presence of the High Commissioner of Pakistan to Singapore, Her Excellency, Ms. Ruksana Afsal. Today's session will be chaired by Mr. Vinod Rai, Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow at ISAS and former Comptroller and Auditor General, Government of India. I shall now hand over the floor to Mr. Rai to begin the proceedings. Mr. Rai, please. Thank you, Shabinia. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh joint lecture organized jointly by the Institute of South Asian Studies and the um, High Commission of Pakistan in Singapore. Um, Institute of South Asian Studies is an institute dedicated to research on contemporary South Asia. And the institute seeks to promote understanding of this vital region of the world and to communicate knowledge and insights about it to policymakers, the business community, academia, and civil society in Singapore and beyond. The Institute's efforts and our efforts have been to integrate our research and understanding of South Asia to the development of Singapore and the relationships between South Asia and the Southeast Asia and within South Asia itself. It is in pursuance of this objective that we have such a distinguished personality to share her thoughts with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Dr. Shamshed Akhtar, the one-time Vice President of the World Bank for Middle East and North Africa. She was the Governor of the State Bank of Pakistan, Assistant Secretary General in the United Nations, Executive Secretary of the United Nations SCAP at Bangkok, and also for a brief period, Caretaker Federal Minister of Finance, Revenue and Industries in Pakistan in 2018. In fact, we are particularly grateful to the High Commissioner of Pakistan in Singapore for having organized or engaged uh, this lecture for us because it's a distinguished personality that we, we would lo love to listen to. Uh, we would love to listen from, from Dr. Akhtar about the government's economic recovery strategy because the pandemic hit us globally. And in fact, in South Asia, we have been very concerned about all the countries are suffering due to the uh, <clears throat> uh, effects of the pandemic. The expansion of the safety net that you have brought about for people and the regulatory relief that you have given, then how Pakistan is addressing the issues of product, improving its productivity and competitive edge as growth will depend on all these factors. And finally, how Pakistan seeks to transform its capital market and the implications of this evolution. So it's a wonderful, wide, and nice landscape for you, Dr. Akhtar, today. Thank you very much for being amongst us. Uh, it's been a privilege to have you on the talk today. And now the floor is yours. I leave it to you. Please do go ahead with your talk. Okay, um, so good afternoon to you all in Singapore, a city I've always admired and have had several visits. Um, I'd like to upfront thank um, Her Excellency High Commissioner and also um, the Institute, uh, as well as Vinod for you to be kindly moderating. Um, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be addressing uh, the Institute. Um, I'd like to spend more time on the capital market, but let me, by way of an overview, um, uh, for those who may not know too much Pakistan, that Pakistan today is a lower middle income country. 
aspiring, of course, like all these countries uh, to jump out of that. Um, it's um, very strategically located and it has substantial potential, like, but like most uh, uh, countries, um, it faced economic contraction uh, and of course, uh, there was a financial fallout, uh, fiscal fallout uh, from COVID-19. But if you were to compare Pakistan within Southeast, uh, South um, Asia region, um, its uh, impact was milder than some of the other countries where economic contraction was much more steep. Um, and that's largely because of the smart, smart lockdowns and swift provision of liquidity and expansion in uh, social safety net of all types, but also safety net for people as well as for the economy and regulatory relief of, um, that has helped swifter rec economic recovery. The pandemic, of course, uh, worsened uh, the macroeconomic and debt vulnerabilities of the country. And we are still caught in that trap. Um, traditionally, our investment saving gap uh, has been uh, a bit worrisome. And this gap, uh, of course, grew in midst of the, of the crisis. Um, however, uh, one has to acknowledge that it's a country with a lot of uh, potential and vibrancy. And we are very glad that we have been able to um, come out of the crisis uh, pretty decently on all frontiers. Now, of course, our um, uh, first and foremost uh, desire is to make sure that uh, we are focused on a broad-based broad inclusive recovery in Pakistan because there has been loss of jobs, there has been uh, displacement of workers because Pakistan has a lot of informality. Um, as a result, all the self-employed people suffered tremendously. So the government's objective is to pursue uh, robust uh, and sustainable economic growth. And a lot of investment is going in that, uh, but also to do so in an inclusive manner. There is, of course, um, uh, one needs a uh, very careful calibrated uh, monetary fiscal stance and uh, the country has managed to do that with the competence of the uh, central bank and uh, central bank of course um, has been at the forefront of uh, providing the, the relief not only to people but to industry but it has as a result of the work that some of us have done uh, been able to establish a digital platform, which is called the Micropayment Gateway System, which has helped um, strengthen our um, um, kind of swift payment system. And uh, we've always had uh, low financial inclusion. Um, this particular transformation in midst of the distribution of the so social safety net is going to help us uh, quite a bit in trying to reduce the poverty as well as reach out to the health outfits, et etc. Et so I have to say that in midst of all this, Pakistan's financial uh, sector not only helped navigate well the shock and mitigate the crisis, but we have recognized uh, glaringly the small size of the financial sector. And right now uh, we are working pretty incredibly hard to build a diversified and resilient sustainable financial system. In this context, of course, expanding capital market has assumed urgency in Pakistan. Uh, of course, that'll help us um, give an edge on productivity and competitiveness side. Now, um, of course, um, uh, why do we need to build uh, capital market is because we have um, a substantial challenge of infrastructure gap, which is close to about eight to 10% of GDP. And our SME financing has uh, gone down. Uh, it's declined to six and a half percent of the total private credit. Um, and of course, our financial inclusion uh, is a worrisome because it has only been able to reach out to 21 uh, quarter of our adult population. 
So we are looking uh, at ways to unleash market-based risk capital and long-dated financing. Uh, Pakistan has been able to transform its capital market since 1990s. It so happens that I was the first one from Asian Development Bank uh, to land in Pakistan to uh, really develop a capital market uh, roadmap for Pakistan. And uh, I'm very fortunate that I have landed at the end of my career to become the chair of the um, of the Pakistan Stock Exchange now. So I'm catching up uh, with where we left, but where we our journey has. So with this, let me now deep dive into the actual presentation. I wanted to give an overview as Vinod mentioned. Um, so we go to the first slide um, and uh, I have my colleague sitting next to me who's uh, got the screen sharing arrangement. Uh, okay, so this, um, uh, the way I'm going to go about that first, I'll provide you uh, an overview and insight um, into the various segments of the of the capital market, and uh, of course, um, uh, then provide some reflection to the different segments of the capital market, uh, but then offer uh, more deep dive reflections um, on the way forward to enhance the dynamism of the capital market. Um, so if you uh, look up uh, there uh, on the on the slide, you will be able to uh, see that we actually um, uh, have an EPICS regulator, the Security Exchange uh, Commission, to which all of us uh, uh, report to, so to speak. And then capital market actually has four very strategic entities, um, which is one is the Pakistan Stock Exchange, then second is the Pakistan Mercantile Exchange, and then we are supported by the CDC, um, Central Depository, and uh, National Clearing and Settlement Outfit. All of these entities, uh, we laid foundation of it uh, uh, when I was at the Asian Development Bank, uh, but now uh, they have matured to be uh, world-class institutions, as I see. Um, Pakistan Stock Exchange and Mercantile Stock Exchange are now two exchanges, and Pakistan Stock Exchanges was uh, created by amalgamating uh, some city-based exchanges because our view was that the price discovery was not that great when you had multiple exchanges because it's at the end of the day, a smaller market. So if you further look down there, we have, uh, I have um, the whole data about uh, the number of brokers uh, uh, and uh, the asset management companies and investors. So the, the bottom line on the, on the slide, are the basic statistics. So I hope you are able to look at, but if you're having problems, let me quickly explain that we have, um, uh, people can invest uh, um, through uh, basically the uh, PSX, or uh, if you want to have commodity uh, investments, then you go to mercantile exchange. <laughs> the four entities that are um, showing on the screen, um, are very well integrated. And that is why the capital market scene requires this picture. <coughs> it's um, Each of them has very firm foundation in line with the international best practices and standards. And uh, uh, what happens is you do invest, uh, at, you trade, uh, you invest and trade at the stock exchanges and then clearing and settlement is through NCCPL and CDC, the um, <clears throat> central depository is the dematerialized institution, offers um, the depository of the shares. <clears throat> Let me move on uh, to, the, to the next slide, uh, but you can already see in the corner <coughs> that our problem is the number of the account holders. Um, they are 200 and 42 account holders, regrettably, a market, uh, we, are, we are a population of 200,000, of which we believe we can easily capture about um, 10 million, but uh, there's a lot of investment needed in financial literacy. Um, 
of course, our company's um, sizes number is large, but so far we have uh, 531 listed companies and our market cap is close to about uh, 42 billion. Um, <clears throat> we have a free float of about 27.47%. Uh, let me uh, now move to the next slide. Um, this um, offers uh, a, a picture of our ecosystem. It doesn't require my addressing it, but you can see uh, we have equity products, debt products, funds of different kinds. We uh, It lists uh, all the companies uh, that um, uh, constitute the PSX companies uh, and so on and so forth. So let's move to the next slide. <clears throat> this will give you um, a snapshot of the key statistics of the capital market institutions. Uh, and as you can see, um, we have tried to give you a pictorial view of, um, of uh, each of these uh, um, uh, companies. Um, now, obviously, if I started to dwell on each of them, it will take a long time. Uh, but if you can trust me, uh, these... Uh, are growing um, steadily um, and uh, uh, we are hoping that our market capitalization according to our own thinking should be able to if nothing else double uh, given the efforts underway um, <clears throat> we are hoping that we should be able to take this number of investors to almost a million or so and i'll dwell into these numbers a bit later but if you see on a corner PMAX, which is the mercantile exchange, uh, there are 50 uh, active brokers that are facilitating the investors on Pakistan mercantile exchange. Uh, it's got uh, retail based, uh, uh, client base is retail and prices of course are um, based on international price feed. Um, <clears throat> it's the market is active almost 21 um, ours, uh, so it's a round, round the clock market. And uh, I have also the statistics of the clearing and settlement, uh, clearing uh, as well as the CDC. I'd be very happy to uh, <clears throat> share all the slides with the Institute so that if they want to share it with wider um, audience, uh, they would have it uh, available with them. Let me now move to the PSX history and structure. And I've captured this because of my long dated affiliation with this exchange. This exchange, um, of course, uh, <clears throat> was the four institutions that I talked about were created at a, as a part of the work that I had done. Uh, but they, of course, uh, grew at different pace and sequence. But ultimately, when the Pakistan Stock Exchange matured, it was corporatized and demutualized. So today I'm sitting in, a, in an exchange which is totally corporate body. And uh, it's been listed um, about it. it's a listed body uh, and over the years we it was fr from a hundred percent broker-led exchange now um, it has uh, three independent board members and uh, there are some domestic shareholders and I'll talk about the stakes uh, on our exchange but the exchange was demutualized and I still <clears throat> remember that we had a regional seminar to talk about demutualization uh, and there is a book that I edited on demutualization of the stock exchange at that point. Uh, in 2016, we actually integrated the city-based exchanges, the Lahore Stock Exchange, Islamabad, which is our capital stock exchange, and the Karachi Stock Exchange, which has, which is the oldest exchange. <clears throat> then in 2016, um, December, towards the end, um, the Chinese, um, bought 40% stake. Um, and there was a consortium of the Shenzhen and uh, Futures and so on and so forth that, that bought 40% uh, stake. And then it became uh, more um, accountable to the foreign and domestic shareholders. Uh, and um, uh, of course, uh, we have 20% stake of PSX acquired uh, by the general public through public offerings. So you can see that um, we have a very diversified shareholding and we have a board of um, 
independent and I'm one of those uh, uh, who was just uh, picked up. Uh, I don't have any stake in the exchange itself in terms of uh, shareholding or anything. Um, and there are others also like me there. <clears throat> um, so if you can see, we have uh, China Financial Futures Exchange. We have Shanghai Stock Exchange founded in 1990. Um, it's the fourth largest exchange in the world in terms of its market cap and trading volume. Then Shenzhen also has an investment. It's the third um, in terms of the traded value in the world. And we have Park China DFI in Pakistan. It, it also bought a stake. And our largest, one of the largest private banks, Habib Bank Limited, um, uh, also bought shareholding. So we have 40% Chinese um, um, consortium, and then we have 15%, 45% uh, domestic investors, and another 15% foreign investors. So uh, that uh, allows this exchange to operate in a very independent manner. Uh, and if you had read the history earlier, uh, you would see what an amazing transformation it is. This is a market which is very integrated in terms of its subsidiaries. Pakistan Stock Exchange um, is tied at the hip of these uh, uh, companies, the central depository company. We have a shareholding of uh, almost 40% uh, and we are set to raise our shareholding in the CDC. And similarly, we have about 50% shareholding in the NCCPL and um, uh, we also have a rating agency uh, that's so, so P and, and also in Pakistan Mercantile Exchange. We hope that in the depository and NCCPL, as we are able to raise our shareholding, we will be able to provide common services. So our cost of doing business, which matters a lot for our um, shareholders as well as for our investors, will come down. So let me move to the next slide. And now I'm going to go faster since I've given you an overview. Um, but I'd like to familiarize you with uh, the fact that uh, we had a, had a lull period um, and we have had a decline in our market cap because of the exchange rate, uh, because we went from um, a flexible exchange rate uh, to uh, a totally market determined exchange rate part of the IMF blessings, but also something we needed to, to improve our competitiveness. So since 2016, there has been a good momentum in our equity listings, and you can see 22 and uh, debt instruments uh, 27. Uh, our gem listing is today uh, four. Um, uh, this is a bit outdated number. And if you look at our sector-wise market cap, uh, we are a very uh, diversified uh, sector, but you will see in another couple of years, there will be further diversification because a lot of tech firms uh, are uh, coming with their IPOs and uh, listing. <clears throat> Moving to next, uh, this gives you, um, I'm sorry for a congestion in this slide, but it gives you in one shot, um, a lot of different products that we offer. Uh, there are derivatives listed um, um, on your left-hand side of the screen. And then we have a main board. We have a gem board, which is for the SMEs, which has just become operational uh, um, recently. And then we offer direct listing. We also have different products like the ETFs, uh, which are both conventional and Sharia. Um, Pakistan has uh, a lot of Islamic mm -hmm. banks as well as Islamic mudarbas listed on our uh, stock exchange. Corporate debt securities, I'd like to see more growth in that, but we have what's called the term finance certificates and Islamic sukuks out there. Then we are trying to capture the government security, debt securities market um, as much as we could uh, possibly. And uh, then uh, we have floated a range of indices. Uh, we have the KSC 100, uh, KSC 30, and KSC all shared indices. And then we have floated uh, Islamic indices, uh, courtesy of one of the largest Islamic uh, banks' um, uh, support. And then we have sectoral indices, indices also oil and gas. 
and few others. We are hoping to bring in more uh, diversification in all this. We are providing real-time data and we are also, we have partnered with a foreign entity to make our data available internationally. We have floated um, real estate investment trusts. Uh, one of them has already been operational for some years, but one of the largest has uh, just got its approval. We hope to see more of uh, REITs in Pakistan. Moving to the next slide, um, <clears throat> um, uh, we have um, <clears throat> some regional comparison. So we have um, um, <clears throat> right now a PSX and emerging markets comparison for your benefit, which has listed, of course, Singapore. Uh, I'm not saying we can compete with it, uh, which has close to 200% of market cap GDP ratio. <clears throat> but we are in the league. Um, um, of <laughs> below 20% of market cap because, as I said, our market cap was slashed because of the, uh, the exchange rate uh, uh, shock that we had. Uh, uh, so we are in the league of, uh, uh, of Colombo Stock Exchange, Istanbul, Nigeria, Dhaka, uh, and Chittagong. Uh, uh, Chittagong and our uh, market cap is close, but we are hoping to raise this market cap uh, pretty soon. Uh, if you see the return on equity and return on asset, which is on the next slide, and I'm hoping you can see this um, graphically, um, that uh, uh, Pakistan um, uh, uh, PSX uh, offers a return on equity of 7.15% and return on assets of 5.8%. And our net profit margin of our company is 33.5%. Uh, we are doing pretty good relative to some of the other developing country exchanges. <clears throat> then um, we also have a comparison of our bond market uh, and derivatives also. Um, so um, our, our bonds uh, are, are limited in issuance is one of the things I've already mentioned and our traded value of bonds is about 135 million US dollars. We are not proud of it, but we are hoping that it will gain momentum because the discussions are underway uh, with various partners uh, who are interested in, in floating more bonds. Derivative markets, uh, we are much more conservative because of some of the issues we had confronted. So we are steadily uh, going to be expanding um, and uh, work is underway. We have had a committee that's been looking at derivatives and options, and we hope to enhance that. But right now, uh, contracts traded um, are 122 um, uh, uh, to 380 to 231 uh, is the number, and uh, our traded uh, value is not very impressive, as you can see. Let me, yeah, yeah, history. Okay, now uh, we are going to come into uh, what we are very proud of, which is the historical performance. So on a regional performance comparison, uh, this is what investors always look at. This is the sheet, which is most important for investors. On a regional performance comparison, Pakistan stood out, posting an average of 8.6%, uh, and US-based return, or this is US-based return over the last 10 years, and you can see that it is the highest relative to Thailand, India, Hong Kong, China, uh, Indonesia, Singapore, of course, uh, and Malaysia, which was unfortunately negative over 10 years. So our price earning ratio, if you see uh, the, the bar chart uh, on the other side, Pakistan offers a PE ratio of 5.03. Um, and uh, uh, of course, some of the exchanges have higher uh, uh, PE ratios. Our dividend yields are pretty high and they stand out to 7.90 relative to, uh, say, uh, Philippines 1.56, uh, or the highest uh, that we have. Uh, um, is Malaysia 4.63 uh, dividend yield ratio. So with this, uh, let me turn to another 
uh, slide, uh, which gives uh, Pakistan and emerging markets 10 year performance, uh, emerging and, um, and uh, frontier exchange. So we have uh, KSC 100 versus the MSC emerging index. Mm, and the blue line represents uh, that graphically. As you can see, uh, the shocks. Uh, inter uh, global shocks do get captured uh, there, and MSC is lower than the uh, KSC versus MSC uh, emerging market index. Uh, so we are we have been trotting at a higher plateau, but uh, of course MSC uh, returns uh, ten year analyzed is four point five two, and KSC is six point nine three. Similarly, if you look at the KSC 100 versus MSC Frontier Markets Index, then um, uh, we again are a bit higher, marginally higher. Now we are we are in the Frontiers Market category. Let me move to the next slide. I don't think I'm going to spend too much time because PMX is not an exchange where I uh, am, am holding the platform, but it's just to give you an overview of the products we have. Uh, I had um, a long briefing from them uh, about a month back, and I was very impressed by their technological edge that they have and their global reach uh, for the commodities. NCCPL uh, is definitely um, uh, the most modern uh, clearing and settlement uh, uh, platform we have. It offers central, central counterparty and risk management. Um, it does all the investor registration and facilitation. It offers the securities level leverage market uh, support when we need it. And it uh, also is a platform which does all the computation of the capital gains tax. And uh, it's just one shot uh, uh, deduction. Uh, there are no several entities to it. And it's um, it offers information security uh, to the investors. Depository. Um, uh, uh, is world-class depository. Uh, um, it uh, provides um, depository of the securities. Uh, it offers trustee and custodial services uh, to uh, open-end and close-end mutual funds to, and to the voluntary pension schemes. Um, and it is it offers e-services. And Pakistan has floated very recently what's called the Russian digital account, which is the support for the non-resident Pakistanis. And in a short period, we have been able to see opening of uh, over uh, 8,300 accounts. Um, and Pakistan has mobilized about $3 billion through these accounts. Um, and this is also being supported by what I talked about earlier, um, the micropayment gateway, which is called in the local language RAST, which is you know the way. Uh, to 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 investments and we are opening up uh, we already have now opened up um, uh, within the screen for people to see when they open up the russian digital account that they will they can see that they have the option to and pick up the brokerage firm and that allows them to actually then uh, invest uh, in the securities. So these are, this is the most uh, recent innovation in the market that we have brought in. Um, then there are also some more new innovations coming, the eClear, and we have established a name at uh, Collateral Management Company, which is the first agriculture collateral management company, which is uh, really being done by, with support of the CDC. Uh, and there are other uh, platforms. Uh, in interest of time, I will go to the last few slides, uh, which is the way forward, or the, how do we move forward. Since we took over um, um, the responsibility um, of the board um, <clears throat> earlier um, um, in, uh, I think, uh, May or so, when I was, was approached by SECP and the Pakistan Stock Exchange, to chair this and the new, new board was formulated, but there are a few old members. We have been uh, pushing on, of course, how do we move the needle where it's not moving? So 
a strategy is under production and just you are probably the first ones even before some of the board members get to see this um, is the way forward we will expand on the supply side we will be taking some steps to foster demand and we will be launching regulatory reforms and digitizing the exchange as much as we can do so in a period of two to three years is our target. So the next slide will give you the breakdown of the measures that we plan to take. We want to bring in more companies uh, to list and to opt for IPOs. We would like to enhance the coverage of the JAM board, and we are working with the asset management companies, holding their hand and making it easier for the SMEs to be able to work. Uh, we also are advocating the stock splits, launching the mutual fund platform. Uh, and as I have said, we will be seeking infrastructure bonds. As you know, China, Pakistan um, has a very strong uh, investment program. Uh, and we have asked uh, that we should explore CPEC companies to be listed and infrastructure bonds to be to be, and I've already talked about development of options. We are urging the government to privatize some of the SOEs through the through the through our platform. We hope to simplify and streamline further customer onboarding. It's almost happened, and we are offering investment and savings accounts. Regulatory reforms are already underway. Fiscal rationalization means means tax rationalization further. We, as I've talked about, we are fostering more integration of the subsidiaries and um, hoping to benefit from synergies. We are working with brokers to, to redefine their business models. Um, let me move to the uh, absolute two last slides, which is the digitization of the exchange. A lot is underway, digital account opening solutions. The 50 brokerage ha houses will offer, offer, offer the facility for online account opening locally and internationally. And we are uh, compliant with the <clears throat> Know Your Customer compliance because of the FATF uh, compliance uh, that we need to uh, ensure. We have um, developed a national trading and surveillance system with the support of the Chinese consortium and the NTS. Uh, we've had a trial of it, but we hope to launch it by mid of this year. Um, and we will have end-to-end -end listing process automated, and we will have electronic IPO facility and so on and so forth. There are, of course, opportunities and risks uh, that are uh, uh, that are exchange uh, business faces, but the first opportunities, we have a large and growing middle class population. As I said, we are at 200 million. Our per capita income is hopefully going to grow and uh, we pro uh, provide listing for the SMEs. We have a lot of new products. Uh, we have urged um, CPEC um, companies uh, to come and raise equity and debt. Uh, we are also developing the secretary market for sovereign and government corporate debts. Risk and challenges are quite a few. Uh, macroeconomic number one, uh, political risk, as you know, uh, we are um, bordering Afghanistan. You know what that means. Uh, we have an undocumented, undocumented large chunk of capital and government has um, cut that umbilical cord and is fast tracking the documentation of the economy. Uh, people do not save, uh, they believe in consumer, but they have a, it's a very high uh, uh, consumer propensity population. Mm, and we have some government instruments that offer uh, high returns, uh, which are making it very difficult for PSX to be, uh, to be withstanding the competition. This is a slide that gives the Islamic uh, uh, options, but let me just go to the absolute last slide, um, which is that I'm working uh, on getting PSX to 
joined the League of Sustainable Stock Exchange, uh, spent a lot of time uh, developing the SDGs at the United Nations. I used to be at the Department of Economic and Social uh, Affairs of the UN, uh, and then I was uh, affiliated with the largest regional commission of the uh, of the uh, 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 of the United Nations, which is uh, stationed in in uh, in uh, Thailand. It's called the ESCAP, and uh, I have been promoting about sixty five countries uh, and uh, to move towards. To, uh, sustainable stock exchanges with the UN uh, New York office. Uh, so we hope that we would set up um, uh, our features that will conform to us seeking certification for this. And we have started a whole advisory support service for developing ESG compliance of our companies. Uh, and this is a, a complex uh, and difficult process, but our companies, 22 textile companies, have our signatories to net zero emissions at the COP26. But there are several other things that are going on. So we are hoping to fast track the compliance with uh, uh, the emi uh, net zero emissions so steadily. We'll get there, but uh, our co contribution to international emissions is almost negligible as you can well imagine, but we are uh, the fifth most vulnerable uh, country in the world to the climate vagaries. So thank you for giving me this space. Uh, uh, I thought I would give you the overview uh, and uh, of the exchange and you can ask any questions either on the exchange or on the economy. I stand ready. Over to you. Dr. Akhtar, thank you very much for this very insightful, very broad, very widespread introduction that you've given us to the capital markets and the initial preamble that you introduced us to. Very interesting to see about uh, the RAST, the Roshan and the micropayment uh, system gateways that you've established, the efforts being made to digitize and the innovative and dynamic kind of strategies that you are adopting. But most interesting, I mean, I, at least for me and some of our um, participants would be that the sustainable stock exchange initiative that you have uh, kind of started and the ESG task force that you have set up, because this is going to be the way forward. And this is where we all will be ultimately headed. Uh, now, thank you very much for making the offer to take up some of the questions. We have um, a few questions lined up. Uh, let me take the first one which says that in one of these slides, it was mentioned that the composition of investors in the Pakistan Stock Exchange is majorly the Chinese, 45%, probably you mentioned, domestic and 15% by foreign investment okay. investors. Now, doesn't this run a high risk as investor base is very concentrated and narrow and also simultaneously expose it to the shocks that may uh, befall China. Right. So uh, let me explain first of all. Uh, obviously, uh, PSX being a listed company, the uh, Chinese bought shares in PSX as a listed company. So they are not investing in the share market itself. So they, I would love them to to actually. Uh, I mean, imagine if we were to have Chinese investing uh, and expanding our investor base uh, in terms of buying our equity and selling our debt and allowing us to do the other way around. But that cross-border uh, listing uh, is something which hasn't happened as yet. Uh, so their investors as yet are not investing in our exchange. We are starting very cautiously with them. And we said the China-Pakistan companies where we have joint ventures should actually list on stock exchange because when China has invested in our uh, companies, uh, it's always with a local partnership. But that's um, you know, all the EPC contracts uh, have involved bringing in money from outside or taking in 
the capital from the domestic investors, but none of them as yet are listed on our stock exchange. So we believe that if they were to bring in the CPEC companies, which are um, in the initial round, we had uh, a lot of uh, energy companies because our single biggest problem vis-a-vis uh, -vis our competitiveness and also hurting our us, uh, we were not able to meet our SDG 7 goal, which is the energy, because our energy excess, our energy affordability it was very low because of uh, uh, the shortages of the energy. But the first round of investment in several energy companies has helped us uh, a lot, but they are not listed. So I am pushing that they start listing, they raise their debt, any new company or any, uh, uh, any existing company, if they list, it'll bring in more depth and breadth on our. So let me qualify that, that shareholding, that the shareholding, uh, 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 this one. If you see, this is in the listed company. This is not in the uh, directly uh, trading. This uh, they bought a share in the listed company of the PSX, and it includes um, the domestic investor. Uh, it includes the DFI, which is listed in the Pakistan Stock Exchange. The 40% capital that they brought in has helped us have a strong capital base of the listed company. Uh, and we have also got 40% uh, or so of the domestic investors, which is the brokers or whatever. Hope I have answered your question. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, it does. Uh, the issue was uh, merely this, that about uh, how much, now your slide shows, yeah, 55% is, foreign owned uh, uh, because 40 plus 15 you have foreign investors which are 15 percent right. and 40 percent is a chinese consortium right. so to that extent it becomes largely a foreign owned kind of an entity i mean that was the, i think the question you know yes so now they have um, five seats on the board of the stock exchange, four, four. And uh, one is, uh, is a Pakistani uh, who is um, a proxy. Uh, so we um, have more Pakistani. Uh, we have uh, two from the other category. And then we wanted independent uh, um, to bring in uh, independence of the stock exchange in the policy and regulatory uh -huh. uh, making. So uh, we do not have a problem with the Pakistani, uh, with the, um, with, the uh, with the foreign, uh, which is, you know, the dominant being the Chinese. They are uh, playing uh, very well, uh, their cards. They, are giving, they have given a huge amount of autonomy to the management like we have. And uh, uh, if they have a certain view, uh, trust me, uh, we are able to talk to them. And uh, it's uh, by voting um, uh, that uh, decisions are made. And so far in my almost um, less than a year, I have had no problem uh, in getting a, a collective wisdom uh, govern the stock exchange. In fact, for the first time, people are talking about the strong governance of the exchange. Uh, which comes, of course, by my presence also, uh, but also with two, three other very highly um, uh, high, uh, high professionals. One of them has been international city banker, uh, and uh, he comes from years of city banker. Another one uh, has been uh, uh, also with international institutions. Uh, so all of them are professionals. That's one for that's very encouraging because it's a strong governance is the one which will make investors, you know, comfortable in, in investing and dealing with the exchange. One another, let me take another one. One of your slides showed, uh, talked about regulatory reforms. Right. And you mentioned that uh, fiscal rationalization and rationalization of taxes and dividends. Uh, how does the, uh, you know, the, the exchange manage this kind of uh, reforms and rationalizations, especially of taxes and dividends? Okay, so 
let me first touch on the regulatory reforms. Um, you know, there is a regulatory affairs committee, which is an independent committee, mm -hmm. which um, through statutory obligation is chaired by the by the chair of the Pakistan Stock Exchange. Uh, and uh, all the regulatory architecture is under review and a lot of improvements have been brought in. And uh, for once, uh, uh, we have started to impose penalties uh, that are penalties related to customers' violation or any other. Our other violations have in any case uh, been reduced because we have strengthened our regulatory department very strongly. There is a, um, a very professional annual report uh, that they produce and there is every month uh, a discussion um, of the Regulatory Affairs Committee. And we have a very strong oversight uh, on the RAC. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, only independent members are allowed to be in the appellate committee of the violation. And this is a very massive change. And I sat in one of the, I chaired one of the uh, appellate committees and the fines that were imposed were kind of the fines traditionally. And when we actually asked for an, an I mean, they came for getting a reduction in the fine and I basically um, uh, enhanced the fines. So that sent a very strong signal. All the um, appeals that have come uh, from the, the brokers uh, were um, upheld, uh, were not upheld, but uh, the fines that were imposed were upheld. And in case of one of them, we enhanced. So this is complete change of mindset on the regul. Now the actual regulatory reforms, I have made a submission to the SECP that I think there has to be much more uh, delegation and the classification of PSX as an SRO has to be strengthened. And I think we are going to have more discussion with the SECP. They have promised that they are very willing to uh, delegate some powers, which will bring in. Now, another thing that we have done is uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, joint supervision of the brokers, which involves the CDC, um, NCCPL, and ourselves. And that's what I said, joint at the hip. So we have introduced a new regime just a few months back of having a joint supervision, which not only saves the cost of supervision, but it has strengthened the supervision and it's reinforcing the two uh, all agencies uh, uh, oversight. So there's a lot that's going on. I just wanted to illustrate through two examples. Now, the second one was the rationalization of the taxes. Of course, um, if you leave it to our brokers, they don't want to pay any taxes, but you know, my career has been more on the macro side <laughs> than on the capital market. So I do think there has to be some taxes but I, I think our, the, the point we are making is that they should not be tax distortions. So the products um, that are offered at the stock exchange should not be taxed more heavily than some other products, which in any case may be offering lucrative returns. And one product which I think um, a lot of uh, countries offer is a national saving instrument. So our national saving instrument uh, was enjoy enjoys uh, a return that government offers. And we have been saying that that needs to be brought at par with, uh, with whatever the yield curve of Pakistan is uh, through the auction system. And within that context, we have said, so I'm actually, there are two ways which we are influencing this dialogue. There is a, a committee of the reforms of the stock market or capital markets, to put it more complete. Uh, and that has market participants and uh, the head of the Pakistan Stock Exchange, the MD. And I am um, I have been co-opted by the finance minister in a five-member committee, which um, 
includes the three governors, uh, uh, myself, uh, a sitting governor and a former governor mm -hmm. and SECP chair and uh, one other uh, very high powered capital market uh, uh, advisory person. So finance minister takes uh, these meetings uh, whenever he can find time, but he's promised it will be now um, every month or so. And in the last meeting, we have given him a submission. And so it can, comes from two corridors. One is the stock market participants and the MDs of these uh, of the uh, the three body four bodies that I've talked about, and then it comes at a higher uh, um, level where we are taking a higher view. So he has a whole listing of the tax distortions, uh, but one notable. Uh, thing that our people are pushing is if you want to raise uh, IPO level, then we have to give a tax holiday to publicly listed companies. That they are resisting because uh, Pakistan's tax GDP ratio is quite low. Um, but they have tried to uh, be softer on the dividend taxes in, in the last budget. So it's a work, work in progress. Wonderful. Um, uh, that that does uh, um, show that there's a lot of futuristic planning being done, very progressive in a large number of ways. And the fact that you'll be able to uh, kind of streamline based on the digitization. Um, I have another question, which says that, are you making any targeted attempts, measures, programs for helping create unicorns in Pakistan? Uh, yes, there is a dialogue going on, uh, but not in terms of any incentive framework at this point. This is under discussion, uh, and a lot of discussion is going on with those who are interested as to what can be done. Now, we are against giving incentives which we cannot offer ourselves at PSX, which are more uh, government-led incentive framework. That is going to come when we have developed a proposal, we will submit to these advisory committees that I have talked about so that we get the buy-in from, from the government. But uh, one thing I can tell you that, uh, uh, on the startups uh, uh, and uh, and the tech firms, uh, there is a lot of preparation underway, and the finance minister has talked about creating a private equity fund to um, to fund the startups. Now, th if that happens, that'll have a huge multiplier effect because they have grown on their own, but not at the pace and sequencing that we would like to see. So e-platforms have also uh, uh, come forward, you know, from the food to uh, other types of e-platforms -pla e like buying and selling textile mm -hmm. um, and other products, even the agriculture um, uh, uh, from the wholesale market to the, so the market innovation will automatically lead to further innovations uh, and then bring uh, more diversity to our platform. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, would you like to, uh, you know, I mean, you did allude to the fact that uh, Pakistan does suffer from a large perception gap and limited financial inclusion, but this dynamic is gradually improving and you have a very optimistic uh, outlook on this, largely based on technological and product innovation that you're doing. Now, have all these innovations have the regulatory kind of forms that you've introduced uh, been able to improve retail investor participation in the exchange? Because uh, during the pandemic, during the fact that you know most uh, people were uh, energized towards digitization, uh, that seems to have been a very welcoming factor in most exchanges. The retail investor participation, how do you see it in Pakistan? Excellent question, because that's really the Achilles heel, as I call it. The issue is we have a very concentrated market of retail investors, which is based in the South rather than um, in Punjab and uh, 
and uh, uh, in other provinces. So what we have done is um, we have invited, for instance, the Khaber um, Pakhtun uh, finance minister was here. We have opened up an office uh, in Khaber Pakhtun. We have allowed uh, brokers to open up offices uh, in the different cities outside Karachi and outside South. Uh, so it is opening. We introduced the regulatory uh, enhancement. We are allowing that because we are very worried if we just give them unattended uh, without oversight that it could lead, lead to, you know, people running a away with the investors' money. The issue is investor education. So we are running massive programs of investor education. We have now set up an office in North and that office is also involved in investor education. We are going to be making it mandatory to the brokers to deliver these uh, investor education because you know we have very low level of literacy here, um, which is in fact, uh, is one of the problems where the SMEs, even if they exist, they are not able to register their businesses in a formal sector. One is, of course, the taxation uh, issue, but uh, because the tax inspectors uh, harass them. Uh, the second is because they don't know how to run a corporatized business. So we have two levels of work going on. One is our GEM platform, which is providing a handholding to the SMEs that want to get listed um, and a lot of good work has gone into it. It's on an experimental stage, but AMCs are helping in that handholding along with us. Uh, we have a dedicated staff who's been working on that. And uh, then we have these platforms in different cities that we are floating. Techno the use of technology, uh, we have allowed a lot of innovation there. So uh, some of the uh, companies are using that platform to reach out uh, uh, technologically, you know, like the jazz and all those, they are partnering with uh, mobile companies to be able to reach out because everybody has a mobile phone. So if you can have a, uh, an app linked up with the trading, uh, then you can educate them. So we have uh, kind of reached out in every platform that we have uh, to start thinking and in and starting the business. But we are keeping a very close eye because one accident and you lose faith of the retail investor. One is also the language uh, thing because uh, we need to have all these apps in Urdu eventually because uh, that's what they understand. And the third is Islamic uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's majority uh, uh, Muslim population. Uh, although we have a lot of uh, a minority growing population, uh, but everybody wants to invest in Islamic instruments. So the growth of that is also hap happening and education there will also help. So phenomenal work is underway. Is our retail investor population growing at at a pace that I would be happy with? Absolutely not. But are we doing the work? Uh, absolutely we are. And um, I want to bring in here the contribution of uh, the institution which, are, which I'm separately chairing, which is called Karandas. By virtue of the name, it's an innovative platform. It has spun off private companies, because I'm a great believer that we should give everything to private sector to do it and get the government out of it. So we have um, uh, now um, uh, set up a, we always had for some years now, we have a Pakistan microfinance company, which is an apex institution that provides liquidity to our microfinance banks, which are starved of liquidity. So they provide, of course, at a competitive price. So that's one that we have a, a strong shareholding as Karandas, and I'm the chair of that company. It's a uh, uh, FCDO UK and Bill Melinda and Gates Foundation's collaboration. So funding comes from them, and then we are investing in companies. There are 
two credit enhancement companies we have floated now. It's the first of its kind and totally private. One, of, uh, one is the infrastructure credit enhancement company. And uh, the second, we are just in the process of discussion, which is an SME credit enhancement company, which will be the first of its kind, where government uh, Ministry of Finance is taking 40% shareholding, and we will have majority shareholding. It's work in progress. Uh, the third, which we are very proud of, the first private small and medium enterprise financing company that we have. We had a, a public sector SME company, but it's not done what we it should have done. So we have just put our money. Of course, it's risk capital, but that's uh, the job of this current DAS, but it's an innovative platform. And all the innovations I want get done are being done in on that platform. And uh, then uh, the beneficiary will be the larger population and Pakistan Stock Exchange will benefit. We are also asking them to have a collaboration with us uh, on the ESG uh, where I have um, and I will just conclude with that point for you to know that I am uh, uh, the chair of what is call, called the Pakistan Institute of Corporate Governance too, because one of the things I've been talking about, the deficit of corporate governance uh, in our companies, uh, particularly in our state-owned companies. So we are providing, uh, we are doing a lot of advocacy and you need a certification from uh, this uh, Pakistan Institute of Corporate Governance. We are revamping all the courses there of the corporate governance and we are revamping the company um, evalu performance evaluations of the boards to be able to you know, hold them accountable for uh, what they are supposed to be. A lot of you know work is underway. It'll take us a couple of years to bring them uh, to the state of art. Uh, but you know, now the digitization is helping us. So Pakistan Institute of Corporate Governance is going to be digitized. We will have all webinar courses. The cost of delivery is coming down. Uh, and through that platform and PSX, I have set up a what is called an ESG task force where they actually just nominated me to share it. And we have um, a diversified thought leaders in that ESG uh, platform. And it is meeting almost every month uh, to brainstorm on how to raise awareness, first of all, do the advocacy for ESG to make it easy. And now we are going to introduce the guidelines, the reporting, the GRIs, mm -hmm. um, reporting guidelines, uh, to start off, we have decided to pilot with uh, with uh, about um, a, a dozen textile companies, and if that experiment is successful, uh, we are we actually are moving to other sectors too. But we're taking it in a phased approach because it's never been done, and if it gains momentum, then it will move very fast. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Akhtar. That's very interesting because financial literacy and hence uh, financial inclusion is a challenge for most of the South Asian countries. Each one of us is being faced with that kind of a situation where we are all taking uh, initiatives to ensure inclusion, especially in the rural and far flung areas. Okay, I have another interesting question for you. And it says that while the push for digitization of banking or trading services for the consumer is admirable, the reality of internet penetration within Pakistan is less than 50%. So how does the government plan to improve the digital infrastructure to reach out to a wider population? Okay, so we have a project which is underway um, and I don't have the latest status report on that in my head, but uh, we are laying optic uh, fiber cables uh, across the country, but also we want digital connectivity cross-border also. And it's a project uh, on which uh, progress is going on. And we have uh, the Ministry of Communication that is paying a lot of attention to it. And uh, also we have had the support uh, for funding from uh, the Chinese for that. So we are hoping that that will give us the bandwidth. But I have to say, the cities are very well connected. Um, and we had given um, uh, licenses to several companies 
to be the providers. So today, uh, even in the remotest of the remote area, uh, you can actually have uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, I can show you that, uh, the jazz, um, you can have uh, these Wi-Fi's devices. So all these, we have about six to eight providers of Wi-Fi. So this is all working very well. If I go to north on the in the mountains, it may be a little weaker, but I still have that. You go there, our penetration there is quite good. Of through this, but also people have mobile phones now. A lot of uh, things as as we are because now for everything, you need to have uh, a formal transaction. So all the shopkeepers are required to have the post terminals. So if the shopkeepers have post terminals, obviously everything has to be digitized because they have to be connected with the banks. And the, uh, the person who's transacting has to have an account. And the shopkeeper, of course, has, start, has got to be, uh, to be reporting his uh, transaction. And this is being done because we are trying to raise the number of taxpayers. <laughs> so we are now through the Nadra network, which is our national uh, ID card system. Now, bulk of our population has an ID card system and the family tree is included in it. So it's all electronically connected. So if they are transacting at the bank, the first requirement is NIC. Now that's all done electronically. So while we may not have the population as yet fully, but now the architecture is all there. Our births and our death certificates are in there. So all this is being electronically maintained. So, you know, Nadra's offices are also connected electronically. So, you know, the firepower is coming. Uh, is the bandwidth all, all there? Uh, no, of course, we need more investments in it. Uh, but I, I'm pretty optimistic. Literacy uh, of, uh, you know, everybody, every member who works in my household has uh, a mobile and he knows how to he or she knows how to transmit money uh, from here to the to the village and they know how to get the money out from the account so they go with an atm card and get the account so everything is now electronic uh, happening now does that <laughs> i agree okay. in fact the last two three years have yeah. been uh, you know, seen exponential growth in that kind of a market. Yeah. And lockdown probably made it uh, much more um, rapid, mm -hmm. uh, the process of digitization. Um, well, you, I'm, I'm sure you'll take another couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, one says that what are some barriers that prevent domestic companies from listing and opting for IPOs? Do you introduce any bar barriers? Well, I actually think they have no barriers, but uh, they will always uh, complain you could simplify the IPO process. I mean, I have interviewed some of the brokers independently minus the management, and they're always saying, well, you could make it more efficient. So we have decided that we would use, um, give them the option of uh, doing um, through uh, technology usage IPOs. But you know, when you're doing an IPO, you are exposed, uh, the company is exposed. So the requirements, as we know, at the capital market for listing in any country are pretty, um, you know, we, we are uh, uh, trying to honor our FATF uh, um, commitments. So we will do the required uh, due diligence of the companies. Uh, we do the due diligence at our level. And then SCCP also uh, has a clearing power of the IPOs. Now, it would be idle if uh, 
uh, SECP were to delegate this function totally, we would save more time. But this has uh, got to move uh, further in our discussions uh, that SECP should not get involved too much into the IPO flotation and leave it to the market because it's really a product of the... But, you know, they ultimately, uh, they are also accountable um, if some, some company gets into trouble and whatever. So they feel, you know, they need to... Uh, also, and they have to submit reports to the FATF and whatever requirements are. And I have been within FATF uh, work a lot myself in other countries, as well as when I was the finance minister in Pakistan defending uh, our FATF regime. So that's one of the problems that causes us to be more rigorous uh, moving forward. Um, the thing is the scrutiny uh, has to be there, whether you're opening a bank account or, and there is a traditional preference for uh, the companies in Pakistan uh, to really deploy their own funding. Retained earnings are, are deployed into expansion of their businesses. So the culture of having private companies not accountable to anybody is very pervasive. Um, and I have seen that, of course, there are benefits of having private companies because then they spin off companies and that helps having productive growth at the end of the day. So the, for instance, I'll give you an example of one of our largest multinational corporation, which then was bought locally. Now, Angro is a big name in the market, uh, uh, and Angro used to be Exxon. And Exxon is involved in multiple businesses uh, from owning LNG network um, a platform to fertilizer to uh, everything that uh, is strategic. So they are involved in export orientation and uh, import substitution. Now, our country needs that. Uh, now, Enron is, uh, Engro is listed, uh, so we benefit from that growth. But initially, some of the companies do not want to list, they want to first grow so that they can have a holding company structure and they can transfer, uh, you know, as an economist, we would say hey, capital transfers are needed to be able to have the growth. So I think uh, these are growing pains, I would call, but at the same time, they, they allow us to grow um, because if you clamp everything, then uh, the growth gets stifled. Obviously, obviously, there will be growing uh, pains, there will be problems, and you have to provide a certain amount of leeway to ensure yeah. as long as the core activities are taken care of, peripheral mm -hmm. flexibility will have to be provided. Can you uh, throw some uh, light on how deep or how well developed is the corporate bond market? Uh, I think this is uh, not at all well developed. Mm -hmm. um, and this is because, again, uh, the culture uh, of the corporates. Um, if they are able to raise money internally uh, from the company's uh, strengths, uh, they don't want to float uh, debt. There is an aversion to floating debt because they have to pay to the bondholders. Uh, and uh, uh, there is there has been innovation uh, but there has been hesitation. We are talking uh, to players that that would be very useful. Now, the first issue there was uh, the pricing, that if you get your pricing of you know, you have to have a yield curve. And the yield curve em emerges from the government securities market, as all of us know, who have been in this business. So we had to develop a yield curve, but the yield curve was getting distorted by certain instruments of the government and also by the management of the auctions of the, of the government securities. Now that auctioning system has improved and there will there is... Um, there are other play, players being allowed in the government securities market, which will include us also. So PSX is going to be also uh, have the platform for government securities trading. 
and a lot of advancement has been actually it was allowed but it was not very proactive so we are resolving whatever uh, little technical issues are left and central bank is now supportive of it earlier we had hesitation from the ministry of finance all those issues we have been sort we have sorted out so once you have a proper yield curve then the corporate bond uh, market would be able to read the signal of the pricing in a better manner uh, and will be able to uh, sell its bonds at a competitive price uh, because the worry is that they'll end up paying the investors higher uh, in the in the bonds uh, than what they can get the equity for instance for <laughs> um, so uh, this is uh, I think the education of the corporate market but some seasoned corporate bodies have promised us that they will take big steps. And this, the last point is market makers in the board market and market makers in other segments of the. So we have had lately uh, our MOUs with the market makers uh, at the stock exchange. So we will have these market makers. So you can see a lot of institutional work was needed. And now that, you know, we have a mature uh, management and a mature uh, board, uh, some of this work is happening at a faster pace than otherwise. Uh, thank you. You just uh, mentioned about the encouragement given by the central bank. So, uh, and uh, I think this is uh, drawing from the fact that uh, you have been a former governor of the central bank. Uh, this question relates to the law recently passed by the parliament, which is uh, I, uh, uh, IMF Pact to give the central bank more independence. I mean, what does it really mean? Because uh, independence for control price stability, for monetary policy, I mean, the banks always were uh, doing this kind of thing. How is important is it for autonomy of the bank? And in what way will accountability of the bank be enforced by this law that has been passed? Okay, now this is a separate seminar, but uh, let me be very uh, brief on this, that central bank um, law is a very critical piece of legislation, in my view. I, uh, uh, it's been amended uh, four or five times earlier, mm -hmm. uh, even during my tenure, uh, but I had prepared uh, uh, a legislation uh, when I was the governor. But unfortunately, you know, as the saying goes, uh, the uh, central banks can be as independent as the uh, as the government's wishes them to be, or for that matter, the parliamentarians be. It's a joke amongst the governors. So, um, and but practically that's what it is. And uh, when my term finished, uh, I went off to become the vice president of the World Bank. And later on, I heard that it was opposed uh, uh, by the senators and the parliamentarians because they want, uh, the central bank to be pro-growth all the time. So obviously, like every central bank, uh, we want to push for price stability uh, and financial stability now. And uh, some of these objectives were getting diffused. So now our new legislation includes price stability and financial stability, and of course, the development, because we are a developing uh, this thing. So it's not as if we are going to absolve ourselves from the role. And as we know, during COVID, all the uh, central banks uh, dropped the legal frameworks and did what was required. Uh, so we all will have to be practical when there is a crisis. Also, um, uh, so uh, the autonomy is in the sense that the stability of the term of the governor, because uh, when governments come and go, they want to uh, just uh, ask the governor to step down and then they bring in their own uh, governor and that is not good for the central bank. So there has been an extension. It used to be a third three-year term. Now it's been extended to five, which could be then rolled to another five, which I think is good, uh, although it's come under tremendous criticism also. Um, the other... Uh, uh, crucial clauses are uh, to um, make sure that the quasi-fiscal functions of the central bank uh, are abolished so that uh, they don't uh, provide subsidized lending to the market, to the banks. Now, 
that uh, has been opposed. Uh, there are some provisions and there are some ongoing schemes. So we have to see how this will evolve. Uh, the central bank's recapitalization request is there. Uh, also, there was a monetary fiscal coordination board, which has been um, uh, uh, abolished and there are concerns how will the fiscal monetary coordination happen so there are some good things and there are some worrisome things there are some that politicians hate uh, to see in the central bank but it's just going to be an empowered institution and uh, as I said on another panel uh, domestically that I wish accompanying the central bank uh, uh, um, independence, there was independence of the Ministry of Finance too, because the two cannot be on a diametrically opposite uh, swing. Uh, and that I speak from my own experience uh, as a former governor. Uh, but as we know, I mean, these are uh, things that take time. Uh, they have set up a liaison committee between them, but I, I think there will be some further amendments to it. But the unfortunate thing was that it became highly politicized, this law, because it became a conditional of IMF. And IMF said, we are not going to drop a single dollar until you pass this law. So that made the parliament furious that uh, this is impinging on the sovereignty. So this uh, brings us all to the to the international governance uh, yeah. that <laughs> the law of the country. I mean, I have my whole career has been in multilateral business. And one of the things we learned the hard way that you cannot have the passage of law as a condition. And I think IMF needs to learn that because it's a case of death. The moment you put in there, it becomes very controversial. And that's what happened. What well, was a decent law, which could have gone through some good healthy debate, did not go through a healthy debate. And everybody kind of uh, said, forget it. You know, this is, uh, uh, we have, um, they are impinging on our sovereignty. So it's a, I could lecture on the G20 and multilateralism, uh, which is my favorite topic <laughs> otherwise. Uh, but, uh, you know, I used to process loans and policy-based loans. We took it to the cabinet approval. We tried not to, but then we did not give a second loan if they did not pass the loan. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is always an issue between the uh, fiscal authority and the monetary authority. And quite often, unless they are not on the same boat, on the same page, it does create problems. I, um, Dr. Akhtar, I do have some more questions, but uh, I think uh, we are running out on time. And you have been very gracious. You have been very incisive. I mean, you've given us a very broad coverage of issues uh, in a large number of topics that you managed to cover and even questions which I thought was, let me say, not strictly in the syllabus. You just mentioned that it was subject for another uh, uh, seminar. Uh, but uh, you have taken a large number of initiatives and those initiatives have been towards digitization or ESG kind of um, parameters. Um, our, our, our best wishes are with you because I think at this point of time, Countries like yours, ours, and other South Asian region need to move in that direction. And we, we need to fortify all our, um, uh, our, our platforms, all our protocols, and ensure that they are, we are able to deliver in the right way. So thank you very much for sharing so much of your valuable time with us. It's been very enlightening. And uh, with these words, I hand you back to uh, the MC, Shavinia. Thank you very kind of you to moderate this session. On behalf of ISAS and the High Commission of Pakistan and Singapore, I thank our guest speaker, Dr. Samshad Akhtar and Chairperson Mr. Vinod Rai for the engaging and enriching session. This brings the joint lecture to an end. We thank you for your participation and look forward to seeing you at our future events. Have a good evening. Thank you. All the best to you all. Thank you, uh, Madam High Commissioner, for arranging this. All the best to you.